Hey, hey, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Awesome. Hey, my name's Chris. I'm our youth and young adult pastor here. This is Amy, our children's director, and we are super excited to bring the word to you guys this morning. Uh, this is our final week of our family foundation series where we've been looking at marriages, we've been looking at parenting, and then today we're going to be looking specifically at the next generation as they walk through the door here this morning. Um, so we're super excited about that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. We can pop up for them. Um, the next generation is what Amy and I spend a lot of our time doing. Um, helping these kids and these students recognize that God, the creator of the universe, wants a personal relationship with them, and then helping them walk that journey of faith together. Um, and so it's going to be a fun time this morning, but before we jump in too, too far, I actually want to just take a moment and actually personally thank you. Uh, my wife Katie and I, we moved here in August, um, and it can be scary to move away from family, to move to a new area, um, to follow after what God is calling us to, um, but we felt like we found a second family with all of you guys, and we are super thankful for that. We thank God for you. You truly are. Yeah, go ahead. Get up for yourselves. Yeah. Um, we truly are thankful um, and blessed, and you really are an answer to a lot of our prayers in the time of transition. So just, again, thank you so much, and uh, I'll let Amy explain, or introduce a little bit more of herself to you. Yeah, so as Chris said, I'm Amy, and I am the children's director here. Um, my husband John and I have been married for 25 years this past January, and yeah, thank you. Um, we have two children and a daughter-in-law. Our son, John Thomas, just turned 24 on Thursday, and he is a sheriff's deputy for Brunswick County, um, and <laughs> I feel so special. <laughs> um, but he, we started Crosswinds when he was in the fourth grade, and so he has come through kids' ministry into youth ministry and is now a part of the young adult ministry. Um, and then our daughter Libby is 12, and um, she was born and raised in this church. She now is in youth ministry, and she serves next door for us in the kids' ministry. And um, it's funny because when we're heading home on Sunday, she'll say, Mom, no one knows my name there. They all call me Amy's daughter. <laughs> and so her name is Liberty. We call her Libby. But her favorite people, the, the little, little bitties in the nursery uh, room and the toddler room, they call her BB, which she loves. Um, and then our daughter-in-law, Shelby, um, she also is in the young adult ministry and serves over with the kids. And so I say all that because um, our family believes in the mission of this church. We believe in the next generation ministries. We say that not only as staff members, but I say that as a parent who's chosen to raise my family in this church. Um, we do want to introduce you guys, though. We're so glad y'all are in here with us this morning. You guys are our people. And y'all are so calm. Don't let us down. Be good for me, okay? For your teachers, for your leaders. Seriously, this does take Chris and I out of our comfort zone, but we do believe that the Lord has a message to share through us. And so um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and pray for us and we can get started. God, we do want to bring you into this time. We want to invite you into this place, God. Get us out of the way and use us to deliver your message, God. Take the words from what we have, Lord, and let them be your words. God, I pray that we could be encouraged by this next generation. Lord, I pray that we could come alongside them. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're we'll jumping into Ephesians 6 this morning. If you want to go ahead and follow along, we'll be looking at the first couple of verses here, um, what Paul has to say to the church in Ephesus. So this is what he says, children, obey your parents. And I know parents, you guys are saying yes and amen, yes and amen to that one, right? You're poking your kids on the side if they're next to you, right? Um, but he says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have long life on earth. And so kids, students in the room, the command is simple, right? Is to obey your parents. In fact, you have the responsibility to obey your parents. And now parents and us as the body of Christ, we actually have a responsibility too. In fact, we all have a responsibility um, and that responsibility for our kids, for these students, for the next generation is teaching them obedience. They need to be taught obedience in their life, right? How many, I, how many see uh, parents, let me see if they raise a hand. How many of you guys had to teach your kids disobedience? Anyone? No, they seem to have gotten that one, right? Yeah, they just, you know, they came, they came that way. They, they understand disobedience in life. Um, and this makes sense in the context of scripture, right? Like when sin and brokenness had entered the world, we all had this natural bend towards ourselves, and this natural bend towards ourselves leads to disobedience towards God and towards others. 
And so we too needed a great example of what obedience to the Father looked like, right? And that is Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate example of what obedience to the Father looks like. And just like we needed an example in our lives, our kids and our students need to have a model or example in their lives of what obedience looks like to God and to others. And so that's, that's the role of all we have. We all have that responsibility in teaching our kids obedience. <clears throat> and now also there might be some of us that are now adults. We still have parents, right? If you're, you still have parents, you still have that relationship. Um, and our responsibility even begins to change as we grow into our own, right? And so rather than uh, having the responsibility of obedience, the principle remains the same, but we change to having respons- our responsibility to honoring our father and our mother, that is our responsibility as we continue to grow. And Amy and I, as we were talking about this, uh, this topic specifically, we actually had to confess that it can be hard to honor your father and your mother. It can be hard to honor your parents, especially when one or both of those people have caused great hurt towards you or towards your family. Um, and we, we began to share a little bit about how our fathers are both alcoholics and have actually caused a lot of hurt both in our lives and our family lives. And it can be a lot easier for us to hold resentment and bitterness towards our fathers. And while we were, you know, uh, as we were uh, discussing this, uh, we actually began to become convicted a little bit because not only is this a command that God has given us, but he actually convicted me with a question. And that question he asked me was, is not your father also my son whom I love? And this began to just shift the ways that I saw my dad. It began to shift the ways that I even understood of what honoring meant towards my father. And it began to shift my prayers to which I'm praying now for salvation in Jesus' name praying for freedom of addiction, and praying for him to know the abundant life in which only Jesus has to offer, right? And it it actually gives me an attempt to try to honor my father even in the brokenness. And this doesn't mean that I just simply uh, forget about the brokenness, I'm okay in the behavior, but it's actually meaning out of love that I continue to challenge him to grow. Just like we would challenge one another to grow in the faith, that I'm challenging him to grow, and I can continue to love him even, even during the times that he doesn't love me or love us, right? And so it can be hard to honor, but we know that this is a commandment from God. And so again, children, kids, your responsibility is to obey. Us as adults, our responsibility to honor. This is what we get from Paul. Um, But why? Why are we supposed to do this? And Paul, I think, lays it out uh, twice here of some reasons on why we should do that. And Paul is actually referring back to the Ten Commandments in this passage. He's actually going back to Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 5 specifically, and he's looking at Deuteronomy 5, 16 specifically, which says, Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God has given you. And so the first reason is it's a command. This is the right thing to do for God. And typically when we uh, approach the Ten Commandments or as Christians approach the Ten Commandments, we like to split the first four um, as they relate to God and loving God and directed towards God. And the last six directed towards others and loving others. Um, But traditionally, the Jews would actually split these right down the middle in which the first five are directed towards God and the last five are directed towards others. Meaning that the command to honor your father and your mother is actually more of a duty towards God than it is to others. That when you honor your father and your mother, you're loving God as much as you're loving those people and honoring those people, because God has placed those people in your life for a reason and for a purpose. And the second reason that we get from Paul on why we are supposed to do these things uh, comes out of the promise that we get from this in Deuteronomy and from Paul that we see um, when he says, uh, when you honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the land your God is giving you. And when I was sitting with this, uh, a phrase came to mind that I think a lot of us have either heard growing up or maybe even give to your kids now. Um, And it goes something like this. Boy, I'm the one that brought you into this world. Don't make me be the one to take you out of it, right? Yeah, you guys have heard that one before, I'm sure. And that usually comes out of disobedience, right? You're hearing that phrase as a result of disobedience in your life. And the reason I think that this phrase came to my mind is because, you know, the disobedience leads to uh, conflict, leads to uh, rebellion, And, you know, things don't seem to go well right in our world when we live in disobedience. But when we live in obedience, we get this promise that we live a long, full life in the land that God has for us. That there's a direct promise of obedience and the consequences that relate with it and disobedience and the consequences that relate with that as well. And so we all have, again, this responsibility when it comes to this command. Whether you're a kid, you're a student, which is to obey, whether you're an adult still trying to figure out that relationship with your parents of honoring them, um, as well as uh, honoring God by honoring the commandments and the things that he calls us to. Um, so Amy, we'll go ahead and jump into verse 4 of Ephesians 6. 
Yeah, so verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children in anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in training or discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Um, if we could just kind of break this apart, this is two sentences. So looking at the first half, this whole, this whole word provoke. Um, and right out of the gate, there have been times when I've had to go to my children and ask for their forgiveness. I've had to apologize for things that I've said, things that I've done, and how I've acted. Um, as a parent, we have a huge responsibility and we have the power of influence over him. It's our words that they hear the loudest. Um, and we can shape them into who they become, but we can also um, damage them for years to come. And so maybe some of you adults in here today are struggling with just that, things from your parents that you've held on to as this resentment has built over time. Um, provoking can come in many forms, such as unkind words, discipline and when angry, embarrassment, humiliation, expecting behaviors that you aren't modeling yourself, putting expectations on things and pressure on things that really just don't matter in the long run. And if we could just sit in that one for a minute. Um, how many of you guys have ever been to a sporting event and watched how the parents behave? <laughs> um, we were a part of a soccer team last year, and just a few parents almost caused our whole team to not be able to come back to the games. And so it was quite embarrassing, and we had to, to kind of debrief our daughter in the car on the way home of, how parents shouldn't talk to their kids or what parents shouldn't say. And so we just have to be careful to fix our eyes on what truly matters. Um, God cares more about our character than anything we can achieve or perform. Um, kids, most of you have some of these sitting in your room at home. Right? They're probably on a shelf somewhere. Thank you. Probably have dust on them, just collecting dust. Right? Yeah, there's dust on these. Remember, my son is 24, right? All right, so these were on a shelf for many, many years, and then they wound up in a box when he moved away. He doesn't want them today because they don't matter to him. They don't have any meaning to him. It didn't, it didn't uh, take part in who he is today. And so if we're going to fix on what's important... It's great that you achieve things, guys. Most of you are super talented. You probably are on honor roll, right? Make good <laughs> grades? Yes? You guys are great performers. I've seen some of your recitals and such. You guys are great athletes. But this is just a teeny tiny part of who God's called you to be. And so in eternity, in the span of your life, things like these, they matter, but they're not what's the most important. And parents, the way that we can honor our Heavenly Father is the gifts that we've been trusted with is to build that character in them of things that last for years to come. Yeah, here's the thing about when we give into the culture of praising performance over the character of our kids is that these things never stop, right? They were achieving these things, grades, trophies, whatever it is that they're achieving. We're building that, that uh, performance nature in them. And these things just continue to grow as culture says or makes it uh, important in their lives. So next thing you know, they're trying to climb the career ladder, get promotions, get titles, get the bigger house, the nicer cars, whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. And there's a couple problems that begin to arise when they do that. The first thing is they succeed really well. They achieve really well in this life. They get everything that they chase after and pursue. They, get the, they climb the career ladder, they get the promotion, they get the nicer cars, the bigger house, whatever it is that they're trying to achieve in this life. Well, when the dust settles and they're all alone, they recognize that there's still a void in their life. They recognize that they're never satisfied, that they're never content with anything in this life. And rather than turning towards Jesus, the one person that can fill that void, the one person who gives us peace, love, joy, patience, you know the rest in this life, they go and turn to the next achievement in the pursuit of the next thing they can achieve. And that's the thing, the enemy wants our kids to do that. He wants us to be distracted for the short term of 80 years, which kids, I know, 80 years sounds like a long time, right? Yes. But when you put it in perspective of eternity, it's nothing, right? Ask somebody that's older than you. They talk, talk about all the time how I feel like I just, blunt, I just blinked and the next thing you know, here we go, 20 years went by. And the enemy wants you to be distracted for 80 years. He wants you to build your own kingdom here on earth rather than God's. Or worse yet, he never wants you to know Jesus, never experienced the life that he has to offer. And because scripture is abundantly clear that not everyone who calls in the name of Jesus will enter the gates. And you can't take any of these achievements with you when you go. So 
that's why God cares more about who you are becoming in and through him rather than what you can achieve. And the second reality that we see with this is that they don't achieve everything in life. They don't get the promotion. They don't climb the career ladder. They don't get the nicer car, the bigger house. And now they have an identity issue. They now feel like they're unworthy of love. They feel like they have nothing to offer the world. And the enemy wants to continue to spear lies in the heads of people. And these are realities that adults still live in today. And that's what the enemy wants. He never wants us to have an impact. He wants us to live in the shame rather than doing great things for God. And so kids, again, God cares more about who you are becoming in and through him than anything you could ever accomplish or do. Even in the, and even in the name of the Lord, you can go and say and have good intentions of doing things in the name of the Lord, but yet still miss the heart of God. And if you want a good example of that, just look at church history. Many people in church history did a lot of things for God in the name of God, but yet missed the heart of God in the midst of that. And God has so much more to offer. And so as Amy was talking about this, um, I actually just recently got rid of mine. Uh, me and JT are around the same age. Uh, I no longer had a need for these as well. I threw them in the, in the trash as well. Um, but I do have this. This is something that I hang on to, something that I've had for a long time. Um, this is nothing special. It's a piece of paper in a Hobby Lobby like uh, frame. Uh, so nothing special, obviously. Um, but it says a certificate of baptism. And so it has my name, it has the, my church that I grew up at. Um, and it says the 19th day of November 2011. And so again, this is nothing special. Um, we don't even believe that baptism is salvation. That only comes through faith alone in Jesus. Um, but it serves as a constant reminder for me of God's faithfulness, of God's love, that God has not yet finished working in my life, that he wants to continue to transform me more and more into his image, that he cares more about me being in relationship with him, transforming areas of my life than anything else that I could try to achieve in this world. And that's what this constant reminder is. And so we have a opportunity and a, respons a responsibility to help our kids see that. Help this next generation not give in to what culture says is important in life, but hold on to the things that matter for eternity, for the sake of their soul. Um, and so, Amy. Yep. Um, so the second part of verse four, this is what I love. This is when we were preparing for this. This is what got me excited. Um, it says, Rather, bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so a few words kind of pop off to me. The first is rather. We could think of that as instead of, in contrast to, um, we're told what not to do in the first half, and now we're told what to do. So bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so what does instruction of the Lord look like? Um, if we think about discipline and instruction, some of the translations use training we can kind of merge those together into one word. I think about development. Like everyone in the room, you have been through developmental milestones throughout your life. Um, when we all were babies, we learned how to nurse on a bottle, and then we started eating foods. Um, we learned to sit up, and then to crawl, and then to walk. Um, we rode tricycles, and then bicycles with training wheels, and then bicycles, and then before you know it, we're in a car, set out on our own, hoping we can stay alive. Um, and it's funny because there are some teenagers here that use the same driver's ed school, and for some reason they use our parking lot to practice in. And first service, I actually called one of them out. Sorry about that. But um, they practiced in our parking lot, and they were practicing in a parking space, and they rolled right over the cone. And so we're like, don't come near the building. Don't come near our vehicles. Just stay out there. Good luck, Leland, um, if you have a teenager. Um, but we bring them up in all these milestones. We watch them develop. But what about the development of their faith? And this is where we come in. Our team leaders come in. This is where the church and the home kind of come together to develop a child's faith. Um, I think one of the things that we do really well over in kids is for our upper elementary classes, we teach the Bible every week. And there's always a moment where we stop and look it up for ourselves. And so today, kids, we're in Ephesians. And so we know that God's holy word um, is his book, and it has two parts, the Old and the New Testament, and Ephesians is in the New Testament. And so we know that that's our book we're in. We're in chapter 4, so that's that big number if we were looking through our Bible, and verses 1 through 4 are the small numbers. And so we kind of explain that, and we let every child look that up for themselves. And then throughout the time that we have, we talk about what does it even mean that we just read? How can we apply it? Who needs to hear it? Who can we take it back out to? Who can we pray for? Who can we share it with? Um, and so 
Pastor Chris referenced last week that we're fortunate. We have about an hour a week with these guys. And statistics showed a few years ago that the average family attended church about 40 out of 52 Sundays. But I bet if we were to look back and find a current one, it's dwindled even more than that. And so we're doing our part here while they're under our care. We're doing everything we can to help that faith develop, help them have this understanding of God. But it needs to be the collective part of church and the home to come together. Um, And so it's pretty easy. If you have influence over the next generation, not just parents, grandparents, if you have a niece or a nephew, if you babysit someone, do they see you read the Word of God yourself? Are you in that intimate one-on-one relationship with the Lord? Are you sharing what He's teaching you? Are you using His scriptures? Um, You know, if they see you doing that, maybe you even do it as a family, do you do a family devotional? Do you ask them what they're learning while they're here? Are you talking about what you're learning while you're here? Another way is to pray. Um, You know, when you all get in the car and go somewhere together, you're forcing the family to kind of be together and just use that time, leverage that time to just thank God. Um, I worked in the school system for many years when my son was coming up, and every morning on the way to school, we would pray together. We would pray for the day that we had been given. And so today, kids, even though it's a gloomy day, we can thank God that he sent rain to water the earth, that we were able to come to church safe, And so just invite him in to be a part of your day. And then to stop on the instant and pray for someone. We're all super guilty of saying, I'll pray for you. But let your kids see you stop and do that in an instant and pray for someone. Um, And then if I'm honest, this one makes me a little bit nervous to share. But church attendance. I think it, it makes me nervous that we could step on toes in saying this. But... Letting your kids see you serve in church and being an active part of this, if you call this your home, an active part each, each and every week. Um, you know, for us as a family, it, it puts us in a position where we choose what's optional and non-optional. Like everyone in the room, most of us, tomorrow morning, we're either going to wake up and go to work or school, and that's just not an option. Adults, the bills are going to roll in. They're going to need paying. That's just not an option. But some things that are an option that fill our days, that fill our calendars, that fill our weeks. If we talk about this instruction of the Lord, God says first commandment to have no other gods before him. He says that he wants us to love him with all of our heart and soul. He wants top spot. He wants to be everything. He wants to be center. He wants to be the foundation. And so as we fill up our calendar with things, by the time Sunday rolls around, It's heartbreaking, but sometimes it's like, well, we just needed a day to sleep in, or it's raining so we didn't come to church, or, you know, we're just so tired from all the things that we committed to. The truth is, is God doesn't design that type of relationship with us. And if you want to teach it to your kids, they have to catch catch it from you. You have to model that. Um, And so partnering with us, um, another way is to cover them in prayer, as we just talked about. These kids need our prayer. Um, They are given the opportunities that, quite honestly, we as adults aren't given. Um, Kids, you guys have the opportunity to take what you know about Jesus back into the school to your teachers, to your classmates, to your peers. You have the opportunity to take Jesus back out to your teammates on sports, uh, sports fields, to your coaches. You have the opportunity, if you live in a neighborhood, I'm sure some of the kids you hang out with don't go to church. Tell them about God. And then, most importantly, they have the opportunity to tell even family members about God. And so they need our prayers because they're reaching people us adults in the room aren't reaching. And so, and they have a bold, a bold way to do it, and it's just amazing to watch. Um, so they need our prayers. Uh, pray for their salvation if they haven't received it yet. Pray for them as they're in a world where culture is doing everything to push them away from the things of God. And we as the church have got to counter back and push even harder with what God's word says. Um, I remember when my son and daughter-in-law started dating, we went to dinner with her mom and dad. And her dad prayed over the meal. He's a pastor. He prayed over the meal. And I remember getting in the car and telling my husband, this will be our daughter-in-law. And I'm perfectly okay with it because they have raised her up just like we've raised him up. If we were to die today and they were under, he was under their care, I trust their judgment. I trust their decisions. I'll be okay sharing grandkids with these people one day. 
So it's never too early to start even praying for your child's spouse. Pray for their friends who they hang out with that have influence over them. We want to give you a tangible way to do this today. Um, when you leave, everyone's going to get one of these cards, Colossians 1, 9 through 10. It says, So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit, all the while as you grow to know God better and better. So the question is, who's your you? My you is Liberty. It's John Thomas. It's Shelby. But it's also these guys. They need our prayers. They need our partnership, and they need our prayers. In just a minute, we're going to move into a time of dedication. Um, we have two families, the Tadlocks and the Ward. So if you guys, one of you want to head out, someone will get your kids to you in the lobby. Um, but before we do that, I think you have one final thing to share. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, you can come grab this stuff if you want. Um, I want to just share a story of Susanna Wesley. Uh, Susanna Wesley was a mom who uh, gave birth to 10 kids, and that's correct. I did say 10, 10 kids. Um, she actually gave birth to 19 of them. Um, and uh, nine of them passed away after infancy. Um, but it, as you can imagine, she knows heartbreak and chaos with 10 kids, um, as you can imagine. And she was also married to a pastor, which you know what that means. They were broke. Yep, that's right. They were broke. Yep. And so <clears throat> even as a young woman, though, Susanna committed her time to God. She made God a priority of her life. She said, no matter how busy I'm going or I'm going to be, no matter what day it is, that I'm still going to give God my best. I'm still going to meet with God. And so she did this even in front of her own family. So she would go out and she would go into her living room, sit down in her chair. And as she sat down in the chair, she would pull her apron up over her head. She told her kids not to, not to distract me while I'm in this time because I'm with the Lord. And the first time I heard this story, I'm just imagining and picturing uh, her walking in, sitting down. And if you've been in a room with two kids, you can imagine the chaos that already happens. But imagine 10 kids uh, and the chaos that's happening and her just simply sitting down and putting her apron up over her head and still making and finding time for God, and doing that in front of all of her kids. And just the lasting impact I'm sure that made for her kids and changed the trajectory of her kids. And now two of her kids actually went on to go be ministers and they actually influenced the lives of millions of people. John and Charles Wesley are their names. John was a traveling preacher and Charles made a lot of hymns. Um, but when I was digging up the story, I actually found a quote from John talking about his mother and the ways that she influenced his life. And this is what he said. He said, I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all of the theologians in England. What a statement, right? That he went to ministry to go and be a pastor, but he learned more about who God is through his mother. And what a simple and awesome picture that is, even for us. Can you imagine just for a moment, if we were a church who were so dedicated above God, we were so um, willing to step in obedience to the things that God had for us, that these kids in this room, that the students in this room would go and say, I learned more about who God is through my church body, through my parents, than I did on a Sunday morning, than I did on a Wednesday night, or anything else that I can find on YouTube. What an amazing picture and opportunity that we have. And the kids need an example in their lives of people who are faithful to the things of God. And that is our responsibility as a church, that we have that opportunity to just simply live our lives and our kids are taking these tangible things away that we have in life. And that's what I love so much about child dedication is um, it's not only just for the kids, not just for the parents, it's actually for all of us. It's a calling for all of us to help steward the next generation, these kids, and helping them take that next step and being faithful in our own walk that they would, too, walk alongside Jesus. And so Amy's going to introduce you guys to these families um, a little bit about child dedication. I love how this Family Foundation series has set everything up to mesh very smoothly with what child dedication is. Um, Pastor Chris started on our first week talking about God's design for marriage um, as a husband and a wife. And then last week we moved into the family unit and what that kind of looks like. And today we've extended, we were supposed to be next gen, but it kind of changed into parenting slash next gen because we're all in this together. Um, parents, you're a part of the next gen. Um, but for a young family just starting out, dedication is the perfect way to start this, this journey called parenting. 
is simply a covenant between parents and the church to come together to say that we are going to do everything we can to raise children in a godly home, living out our faith, that's all of us, and praying for the day when they choose Christ as their own. Um, this is the Tadlock family. This is Liz and Aaron and Mr. Grayson. <laughs> <laughs> He's waving off. Oh, sweet. Aw. And then the Ward family, Amanda, Chris, Ava, and Porter. And uh, um, they have completed a parent dedication booklet. They have committed um, to do these things. They have shared that it's their desire to dedicate their child. Um, they understand that they have to have a relationship with Christ themselves, and so they've written out their testimonies for us to, to read. Um, they've written their children letters of who they hope that they become, who they hope they develop into. Um, and so it's all of our parts to come alongside them. They've invited people here with them today, family and friends. And so they're choosing you guys to be a part of this journey with them. They want you to have influence over their children. They're going to need you. Times are going to get tough and hard. And so we're going to pray over them now. Um, guys, we've actually included the Colossians uh, card in this for you. Um, you're you as your children. It's Porter. It's Ava. It's Grayson. Um, and then, what a tool to give you more better than the Word of God. This is your guide to get this right. This is your answer book. This is where you're going to go to. This is how you're going to keep that intimate relationship with God yourself. Um, so church, if you'll just extend a hand, we're going to pray over these children now. God, I just thank you um, for Grayson, for Liz and Aaron. Lord, I thank you that you sent them here to this church so we could partner with them. Lord, that... Um, we're waiting the day when Grayson says yes to you. God, when he knows the love you have for him, when he learns the Bible, when he, when he hears this, this that has this spark that ignites for the first time of this true understanding. God, help Aaron and Liz. Strengthen their marriage. Strengthen their relationship with you. God, bring those around them to help them in this journey. And we just anticipate the day when he says yes to you. And God, I just pray for Chris and Amanda. Lord, I thank you for Ava. Lord, she's the preemie that we prayed for. I thank you that she's here today healthy, that you uh, created her just as she should be. Lord, I thank you for Porter. I thank you that we've gotten to know him over the years. And I just thank you that, um, yeah, I just thank you that um, he has uh, been in your word in class. Lord, he's hearing about who you are. He's getting that very beginning of learning your stories, learning your words. And God, I pray for Chris and Amanda again, that you would strengthen their marriage, strengthen their relationship with you, God. Build people around them to help them in this journey. God, we just await for the day when these kids say yes. And God, we ask that you give us more of that. Send more young people to this church so we can have influence over them, God, so we can partner with them. Lord, they are the ones that carry your message to generations to come. Thank you for this opportunity again, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. We also want to take a time just to uh, pray over our next generation. So if you are under the age of 30, would you mind just standing for me? I know it's a wide range. I know it's a wide range. I don't know where the cutoff is, but hey, prayer is always good, right? Um, and for the body, if you just look around at how many young faces we have in here of the next generation, what a blessing that is, right? Yeah. And so we want to go ahead and uh, we want to go ahead and pray for them. Um, so if you again just extend your hand out to the nearest nearest one, and we'll go ahead and pray together. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you for the many people here, just even this room, the generations that make up this room, Lord. And Lord, uh, I read a statistic the other day that said that Gen Z and Gen Alpha are on track to be the least religious uh, generation yet. But Lord, you are not done yet. That, Lord, you still have a plan and a purpose for their life, that you have something in store, Lord. And I pray that there would be a revival in these generations, Lord. That they would want to seek your face, that they thirst after your presence, that they can't help but share about who you are, Jesus. Would you light that fire in their hearts and their souls, Lord? And Lord, help our parents and the body here to remind, be reminded of the responsibility we have and help shaping and molding and taking those next steps, Lord, of faith. That they can be mirrors that reflect uh, just their obedience to you, Lord. 
in which this next generation says that I learned more about who God was, who you are, Lord, from my church body. And we thank you for the ways you're gonna go before us, the things that you're preparing ahead of us, Lord, and just your faithfulness in the midst of it all, your patience, your love, your mercy. So continue to help us, Lord, and just thank you for everything that you do. And Lord, I pray that now specifically, there's a person that doesn't yet know who you are, doesn't have that personal relationship with you, Jesus, that today will be the day that they take their next step towards you, Lord. They would declare you as Lord and Savior of their life. They want to know the abundant life that you have to offer them, Lord. So we just give you all the praise and the glory and the honor, Lord. It's your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. We're going to sing one more song called Cornerstone. And as we, as we sing the song, uh, I'm going to ask our prayer team just to come forward. Um, and if you want to have prayer either for yourself or for your family, um, we would love just to have the opportunity to pray for you as we go ahead and finish out in our morning.